Well, good morning and welcome to Parkhead Nazarene Church and the New Charter Online. My name's Ian Wells. I'm one of the pastors at the church and we're delighted that you've joined with us as we worship together and find encouragement in God's Word. So wherever you are today, welcome. Now this week we're continuing to look at the letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi, more usually referred to as the Book of Philippines. And this week we're looking at the rest of chapter 1 and thinking about how our Christian view of God and his purposes and also our Christian belief in eternal life, how these impact the way we think and the way we live now in this world and how our faith and belief in these directions helps us actually stand stronger when we face challenges now. I don't know about you, but as we continue to face the realities of COVID, we, can, uh, we can't help but be presented with our frailty and vulnerability as human beings. And much as we appreciate science and technology and research, especially at times like these, there are just some things that make us realise that we can't know everything. We don't know everything. And that there are some things in the end that we cannot avoid or escape or dodge, no matter how clever and creative we might be. And so while we long for a vaccine and an end to COVID, we also realise that all of us are mortal. And the question of how we view death and eternal life is critical to humanity. And at some point we have to make peace with that truth and also then live our lives in a different way because of the eternal hope we have in Jesus Christ. So today we're going to look at how our eternal perspective impacts our present perspective, why God's bigger picture impacts our present struggles, and why all of this is good news for those of us who are in Christ. So let's pray and invite God to encourage us as we worship and listen for God's voice into our lives. Let's pray. Eternal living God, we thank you for your love that is everlasting. Your word says that your love endures from generation to generation and we are thankful recipients of your perfect love. And we confess that we do not understand everything about life or suffering or death or sickness or, or even COVID. But we also confess that in the midst of these realities, we find comfort, strength and hope in you, the living God. And so we've come to express our dependence, our need and our trust in you, the eternal God, who knows and sees what we cannot see and what we do not know. And as we express our trust, may your word and your Holy Spirit shape our minds, our hearts and our lives towards what is best, that we might grow stronger in Christ and in the ways of the Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and balanced peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is ever bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine! I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and for in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hope, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley, He will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome yet not I.
know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and He was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold. My sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing. I am free. It's not I, but through Christ in me. When with every breath. I long to follow Jesus, for He has said that He will bring me home. And day by day, I know He will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace God and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defence of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can start trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is, in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. I have been loving all these weddings during this pandemic. It's just so lovely to have some good news and a reason to celebrate when times are tough. But what I've loved most is watching these couples as they have prepared to be married with ever-changing circumstances and plans. I love the way that they have prepared, persevered, the way that they knew that the most important thing was to be together before God and say their vows regardless of their surroundings. They've prioritised having a marriage rather than having a wedding. And it's been inspiring to watch them constantly having to adapt and deal with the disappointment of cancelled plans or the sacrifice of the weddings that they've dreamed of. And although it's been difficult, they have kept hold of the truth that the mission to be married is worth dealing with all the obstacles. The commitment to love one another is worth every disappointment and change of direction. Paul, who writes this letter in the book of Philippians, was someone with great conviction that the mission, his mission to share the life-changing good news about Christ is always greater than anything else. And it didn't matter what obstacles he faced or what stood in his way, he was able to rejoice as long as his mission was being fulfilled. He had given his life to it in an inspiring way. And so when we read these verses in Philippians 1, we see that so clearly. He is basically under house arrest and even in that, he says it brings more opportunity for him to preach about Christ because he is able to say that he is in chains, but he is in chains for Christ. 
He's even rejoicing with those who are preaching Christ around him, even the ones who he thinks are preaching about Christ just to make things more difficult for him. And he says he just doesn't care as long as it's all about Christ. He says in verses 17 to 18, there are others who do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful for me. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. This is actually just so incredible. Rather than this being an opportunity for Paul to have a moan and hold a resentment or carry offence, he is happy to endure it if it means that Christ is still being talked about. I was laughing as I was preparing this because I couldn't help but imagine Paul in our 2020 pandemic situation. He is under house arrest, socially isolated and limited. And so if you imagine, here's Paul in 2020, WhatsApping his pals to update them on what's happening. And in those messages, you find nothing about how he has been wronged. He's not sitting in a pity party for one because people are using this as an opportunity to make him feel worse. Because Jesus was his top priority. And instead, he wants to focus wholeheartedly on making sure Christ is preached. We are looking today at what we can learn from these verses about having a different perspective. And truthfully, Paul has a perspective of faith that means he doesn't even care about his own suffering as long as it somehow has a purpose of bringing glory to Christ. He had a perspective that was all about Christ and so much less about himself. Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body
Well, we want to say thank you to those of you who took time to pray for the church board as they met on Monday evening, uh, to pray and talk about the future and specifically about the ministry team following my announcement that I will be leaving. Uh, first of all, we want you to know how much we sense the prayers of God's people and the presence of God as we met. Uh, there was a real tangible awareness of God's peace and a real unity across the board as we prayed, talked and discussed. Now these things take time to talk through and so while there are no definite decisions being made after the first meeting and that's what we expected, um, we did sense the freedom to explore some different and creative responses to how we might develop the team for the future. And that this was actually a really exciting time and opportunity for us that would allow us to enter deeper and more fully into what God has for us now and in the future. And we did hear from God. And during the times of prayer, we received some pictures and verses of scripture, words of encouragement and affirmation from the Lord. And these included verses of scripture from Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my Holy Spirit. Or Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned and heard my cry put our feet on a solid rock, a firm place to stand, a new song in our mouths, and many will put their trust in God. And John 14, when Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, trust also in me. And we received some pictures or visions, one showing old paths that had been concealed by the dust of time, paths that were wonderfully uncovered by the wind of change, paths that then became clear for us to see, like new paths to us, as we sought and followed God's leading. And we sensed a vision of the church focused on equipping and releasing the whole congregation in mission and ministry, perhaps in ways that we haven't seen before. And then finally, a picture that reminded us of our calling as a church, a picture of the reality of darkness around us in our communities, Particularly of someone shivering alone in their home in the corner of an empty room, longing for someone to hold them tight. And the outcome of all of these words and pictures was a renewed sense of purpose, calling, determination about our outreach and ministry together in the community. But combined with a renewed sense of faith and joy and excitement about the future and what God would do in us and through us in the times of change. And actually, this is exactly what we needed at this point of change. And so not only was, the real, was there real unity about exploring different options for the future, but there was a renewed faith and expectation about that future. And so we are holding on to these words and pictures from God as we continue to pray and seek him and believe he's already speaking to us. Now, the board will meet again on Monday, the 2nd of November, to continue this process of prayer and discussion about these next steps, and we'll continue to keep you updated as that happens. But thank you for your prayers, and please keep praying through this important time as we listen for God's voice and his leading. Now, let me also remind you of the next few service times at Burger Street. Uh, there are still spaces for this afternoon's service, that's Sunday the 25th of October at 4pm. And then the service will be repeated again on Wednesday the 28th of October at 8pm. And then on Sunday the 1st of November at 4pm, we're going to host another children and family service at Burger Street. The last one worked so well and uh, so there'll be spaces for 10 households or 10 families for that specific children and family service. Now please remember that if you want to attend any of these services, you must sign up by messaging the church's Facebook page at Parkhead Nazarene or email to parkhead at nazarene.org.uk or contacting one of the pastors. You must register. And finally, uh, this will be the last week that you can contribute to the fund that we opened for the families who were affected by the fire in Whitby Street a couple of weeks ago. And so if you would like to give to this fund to help the families, then please go to the Virgin Giving page that is on the church's Facebook page and you can make your donation there. If you're not able to do that for any reason, but would like to give anyway, then please contact one of the pastors and we will help organise that donation for you. So again, thank you for being a giving and a generous church. Um, we are blessed and we thank God for you.
In my wrestling and in my doubts In my failures you won't walk out Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea In the silence you won't let go In the questions your truth will hold Your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, You are the peace in my troubled sea My lighthouse, my lighthouse Shining in the darkness, I will follow you to shore Christ is being preached either way, so I rejoice, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past, and I trust that my life will, be, will bring honour to Christ whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful works for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it's better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive, and so I can continue to help all of the all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. I don't think we take much time to think about what heaven will be like. 
I'm not the type of person who likes to spend lots of time thinking or debating over things that I don't think I'll ever know the answer to. I guess I'm a bit more practical rather than a thinker. I do really enjoy what Paul has to say in these verses though. He doesn't really call it heaven and he doesn't go into a lot of detail but he speaks quite simply about the time after death and describes it as being with Christ forever. And for me, that is a simple and beautiful description. When I think about what heaven will be like, I think about all the things we already know about Christ, the things that we already know about what the Spirit of God is like, and I imagine that forever. Pure and absolute joy, overwhelming love, peace that stills your mind and your soul, no fear or anxiety, complete restoration in every sense of the word, things that we only understand a fraction of right now. And when I think about it like this, then it doesn't surprise me to hear Paul say that he's torn about whether he wants to stay here and continue to tell others about Christ or whether he wants to just go and be with Christ right now. His anticipation of death is not some morbid desire to leave this world, but it's a recognition that it will mean that he will be with Christ. And that is his desire to experience that in all its fullness. I said before that I don't spend too much time thinking about or debating about the details of things like heaven, but I certainly thought more about it when my mum and dad died. When my mum died, I had such a peace that she was at peace. I felt like, although I didn't know for sure what heaven was like, I knew for definite that she was a woman of faith and she was with God. I thought about it even more when my dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer. So often we go about our days living our lives and we don't really think about what's to come much. But when you know that death is coming and it's coming soon, it definitely impacts how you think about it. My dad faced that with such an incredible faith, trusting God each day and just worshipping God in the midst of a difficult journey. That's how he got through it really. And as we could sense that he was nearing the end, we had more and more time to talk about how thankful we were that we could be sure we, we knew where he was going. And in the end, I could see my dad's sadness to be leaving me, to be missing us, but his assurance and his peace that his fight would be coming to an end and that he would be able to rest in the arms of the Almighty. Two different experiences of death but both equally filled with peace. And both so important because in a culture that can find it difficult to talk about death, they gave me an opportunity to face it as a person of faith and to think about the reality of the things that God promises us. We talk a lot about how God longs to make a difference to our lives right now. God's promises are for today and that gives us so much hope and a lot to be thankful for but there is so much that will only be dealt with in his promise of eternity. There may be hope for today, but I don't think we give enough focus to the hope that one day we will know complete peace when we are with God and all of the pain and suffering in this life will fall away and complete healing and wholeness will come upon us because we will be in the presence of God, the God who we know and trust. And that is something to be so thankful for. In verse 21, Paul says those famous words, to live is Christ, to die is gain. If that doesn't make much sense to you, then listen to this from the New Living Translation. He says, for to me, living means living for Christ and dying is even better. We've talked about the fact that Paul had such an understanding of heaven that meant he could look forward to it but it even had such an impact on how he lived his life on this earth because he believed you're not really living if you're not living your life for Christ. He wasn't concerned about things like, you know, finishing his Netflix series or buying a new car or earning more money or going to the pub with his pals, although they never really had any of those things. But actually, if it didn't change lives for eternity, then he wasn't interested. And this perspective changes everything about the way Paul lives. I mentioned before about how he viewed suffering, but it's even more than that. It's the fact that whatever happens, whether he lives or dies, it's a win-win situation because with Christ, it is all good. It will result in good. It will be used for good.
There are so many similarities in what he's saying here with the story of Joseph in Genesis in the Old Testament. This was exactly his perspective and it's honestly one of my most favourite Bible stories because I love reading through his journey that is just so up and down and backwards and forwards. Sometimes I feel like my own life has been a bit like that, just one thing after another. But I love when I read about Joseph and he just honoured God in every single season in whatever small way he could. And at every point we read that God was with Joseph and God's favour and blessing was on him. If you don't know the story of Joseph, he is sold into slavery by his brothers because his brothers are jealous of him. And while he's a slave, he just tried to be the best slave that he could be. And because of that, he became so trusted with everything that the master owned. He became the top slave. And then he was severely tempted. And although he resisted temptation, he was falsely accused and he ended up in jail. And I think definitely at that point, I'd be a bit angry at God that I had been faithful and still ended up in prison. But that's not Joseph. Even though he was in prison, like Paul, his mission was still the most important thing. And so Joseph still honoured God by helping others, by pointing them to God, even though he was in so much need himself. And because of that, he eventually finds himself at the right hand of Pharaoh. And again, his faithfulness to God shines through. And so Pharaoh appoints him to the highest position. And eventually, Joseph is faced with his brothers who started him on this ridiculous journey by rejecting him as a teenager. And he has the opportunity to repay them for all the harm that they had done to him, for the tough life that he has experienced. And this is what he says to them. Genesis 50 verses 19 to 21. Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. There we see that perspective again, the same one we see in Paul, that the suffering is worth it because the most important thing is for God to be first for God to be highest, for God's work to take priority, for his plans and his purposes to be realised regardless of the effect on his life personally. They both had this perspective that God would work through everything they faced. It would all be worth it if they could continue to praise God throughout it. This is the perspective that I long for in my own life. I want to be the kind of person who can face anything with courage and hope, proclaiming the good news of Christ in every circumstance. This is the kind of perspective I want us to have as a church, that we will use every opportunity to share what God is doing and how God is working, knowing that nothing is ever wasted with him. And I pray that we will have the same heart as Paul that whatever happens, we will see it as a win-win situation. If we get to live, then we will live wholeheartedly for Christ in every area, holding nothing back, giving our all to him. And then when we die, we are thankful for the hope and assurance we have that it would be a great joy to be with Christ for eternity.
the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whenever I come and see you again, or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for Him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. Well, what a great insight Shelley gave us into Paul's mindset and perspective. The priority of Christ and Christ's mission, combined with the eternal hope of being with Christ no matter what. All of that together fueled in Paul a resilience and strength that permeated every part of his life. It didn't matter what came his way, the obstacles, the oppositions, even the oppression, because all of it, all of it was worth it for Christ. And even if the worst happened, even death itself, still Paul had no reason to fear, because even in death, Christ has overcome. I love where Shelley began. She began with stories of love and marriage, that when love is present, we will face and endure pretty much anything for the sake of that love. And really, this is the heart of Paul's life and message. Loved by God, love in God, and love for God. And as a result, Paul's heart and mind were captured by divine love. And so the places of suffering were a price worth paying for the sake of Christ and his love. And no hardship would deflect Paul from this path. And so as Paul finishes what is in effect a word of personal testimony, he urges the Philippian church to live in ways that are worthy of Christ, no matter what happens. 
just as he has continued to live in a way that honors Jesus, even in the face of isolation, separation, intimidation, so too he appeals to them to do likewise. If you remember from last week, Paul prayed a prayer for the church in Philippi that their love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Well, Paul's testimony here is a living witness to what that looks like, that God's love for you, for us, and our love for him and his love in us is much more than just a feeling or emotion. It's the very purpose of life. That's the insight we need about divine love. The love of God endures forever and ever, from one generation to the next, and into all eternity. It is of ultimate and eternal significance. And in many ways, it's all that matters. It's literally critical. And so Paul says, live your life as if God's love was all that matters. You know, as Paul writes this letter, he had no way of knowing whether he would ever make it back to see the people in this Philippian church that he loved so much. But whatever the outcome, Paul wanted to hear a glowing testimony of how they had stood firm in the faith, in the gospel, in Christ, no matter what. But there's something else of real importance here, that this is something that they would do together. The Christian life is not intended to be a solitary road, not even in lockdown and COVID, but instead we travel this road of earthly life together. And so Paul writes, Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. That's a picture of solidarity together. Solidarity in Christ and for Christ. Solidarity in his love. Solidarity in one spirit, Christ's spirit, as if we were indeed one man standing strong. In other places, Paul encourages us to spur one another on in this life of faith. And here he uses language of effort and energy and perseverance in pursuing this life of faith together, contending for the faith, striving together. Now the image here is one of a group of athletes, a team, working together for the same cause, the same prize, the same goal. In fact, the word athlete comes from the Greek word that Paul uses here for contend, athleto, an athlete who competes. And Paul adds a little prefix just before this word, soon, soon athleo, which slightly changes the meaning to represent working and striving together. Can you see the picture he's painting? of how we persevere together, whatever happens. And when we have this kind of solidarity, clear in our minds about the real goal, the real purpose, the real cause, that is Jesus, then we will not be afraid, no matter what happens. And Paul's honest. He doesn't hide the truth, which is that if we are truly living for Christ, then as well as the hardships that come to everyone, suffering will be part of the journey. But when it comes... It will not overwhelm us. What a different perspective on the world, on suffering, on life. Our vision, our eyes, our hearts, our minds are set on something and someone far greater and far higher than anything this world can throw at us. And what's more, we don't walk this journey alone, but instead we stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. Church family, Unlike Paul, I'm pretty certain that I will come back and see you in the future. But even if I only get to hear about you in my absence, I want to hear that you're standing firm in one spirit and contending together as if you were one man for the sake of the gospel. That's what we're known for. And I urge you to keep on doing so. I reckon Paul knew that the Philippians would have to go through their own trials and sufferings. They too would face hard times, opposition, even intimidation for their faith. But having shared his testimony of how he has a different perspective, a higher perspective, he invites them to do likewise, to lift up their eyes to this higher perspective, to Jesus, to his cause, to his mission, to his love and to his life, and ultimately to our eternal life. This is the kind of people Jesus calls us to be. This is the kind of church he wants us to be. And this is the kind of church we want to be 
no matter what. And as we do, we, we will not be shaken. There's a whole world out there that doesn't even know it needs Jesus yet. And some are even radically opposed to the idea. But those who grasp the perspective of Paul find courage to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. So church, rise up, take courage, contend together for the faith, lift up your heads, take hold of Christ and live your life worthy of his gospel for the sake of Christ and for the sake of our world. It is time for you and I to live out this revival anthem. God of eternity, God of love, God of glory, we lift our eyes upwards to you. Almighty God, risen Christ, promised Holy Spirit, you are our God, we are your people, and we will not be shaken. So let us not grow weary in the midst of trials. Let us not go weak in the face of temptations. Let us not go silent in the day of trouble. Instead, God, Revive us with the spirit of Christ, the passion of Christ, the courage of Christ, so that our lives declare to live is Christ. In his name and for his cause we pray. Amen. <laughs>